Connecticut Distributors Inc. for their hospitality, hospitality and welcoming, welcoming us here. Thank you. I would also like to thank Greta Vermeil, Assistant Director of the Stratford Health Department, Kendra Epps, our Drug Free Community Project Coordinator, and Nina Chanada, our Drug Free Communities Project Evaluator for organizing the program. On behalf of the Stratford Partnership, we are so grateful that you are joining us today. We have a long history of working together to benefit Stratford's children, youth, and families. Beginning in 1976, when the step town established the Town Youth Advisory Family Advisory Board. In 1988, we were restructured as a Youth and Family Advisory Board and expanded our efforts to include prevention with the support of our local Prevention Council grant. Thanks to this Prevention Foundation, the town was awarded additional prevention grants from the state, of, state in 1998. And five years ago, we renamed <coughs> or rebranded the coalition um, to the Stratford Partnership for Youth and Families where the town was awarded a federal drug-free communities grant which significantly increased our capacity to reduce youth substance abuse. This morning, following remarks by Mayor Poydick, two of our youth leaders will give you a glimpse of, of the most recent data collected by the Stratford Partnership. You will also have a chance to share your thoughts and ask questions. We hope that you continue the conversation with your family, friends, and neighbors and colleagues. Again, thank you for caring for our kids. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Laura Poydick, who is the past co-chair of the Stratford Youth and Family Advisory Board, and shares the vision of our healthy youth and families thriving in a safe, drug-free Stratford. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you all for being here today. It's, um, it's a little humbling when I think back about the decades ago when I was involved with the Youth and Family Advisory Board and all the things that we started to do about community conversations and sharing in the vision of how we wanted to improve the quality of our lives in Stratford. And this is, this is just another phase of it. And because we've stayed together and worked together so long, we keep getting better and better and better. The data analysis that we've always used, and there's, there's, some, there's a partner here who's been here for a long time, <coughs> Anderson, who works with RISAP, uh, the data that we started collecting with them decades ago has continued on today, and that's what you're going to see, that continuum and that trend. And it's so important when we assess of how we're going to address issues that affect us, youth and families, and the town of Stratford, how we watch those trends and how we improve upon it. So I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm thrilled to our partners at CDI who've been amazing, the Stratford Youth and Family Advisory Board and the partnership. Um, again, to the leadership of this whole group, and there's so many of you, but I'm going to target on Tammy Kojanowski. Yeah. Andrew, Andrew, or let's bring in the back. Who also collaborates very, very strongly with the police department. Chief McNeil is here. Stop laughing at the joke. Yeah. <laughs> Our fire department. Deputy Chief Lampard is here. Public Safety Director Larry Ciccarelli. <laughs> and all of our nonprofits, Sterling Trust Library, Sherry Zanaska is here, the Executive Director. Without 
companies partners? We are. We are. We are as strong as we can be. And so the last one that I can see that I almost forgot was Maurice McCarthy, our public works director. trying to get after school programs into the school district in an effect of the custodians. Well, Public Works has custodians that are not in school buildings, but in buildings that we use all the time. Public Works affects the fields and the roadways and, and the buildings. And so as this partnership, we just have to think about all the things we do together. And then the, the last person that I just segued into for, um, for the school buildings is our superintendent of schools, Jim Robinson. Thank you. Partnerships for Youth and Family, and I am a senior at Stratford High School. So how are we all doing this morning? Great. Are we doing good? Happy yeah. to be alive and well? Yeah. Great, great. So everyone, everyone here understands that substance abuse has a huge impact on individuals, families, and communities. In order to succeed in reducing youth substance use and improve health, safety, and quality of life, we cannot rely on our assumptions. We must use reliable data, and one important source is the Search Institute Student Survey, which is conducted every two years with a sample of middle and high school students. This allows us to monitor trends in emerging issues about substance use and other risky behaviors and plan the activities and program that are most beneficial. The partnership utilizes the strategic prevention framework and evidence-based planning process in which we use data to guide all decisions, from identifying priorities to choosing the most effective interventions. Gathering this critical survey data is only possible with the support of the Stratford Public Schools. So here's a big shout out to all the administer administrators and teachers who make this happen. good news. Overall, trends indicate that Stratford youth are making healthier and safer choices. So go us. <laughs> and kudos to us as well. <laughs> Reducing the rates of past 30 day use of a substance is one of the most important indicators of our local performance in meeting prevention goals and objectives, as well as one of the nation's outcome measures. 30-day use rates indicate that a teen has been actively using that substance. The gray bar is 1998, the orange bar is 2008, and the blue bar is 2018. You see that there are significant decreases in alcohol and cigarette use among Stratford teens. Since 1998, reported alcohol use has decreased 48% and cigarette use 86%. Since we began collecting 30-day use of marijuana in 2011, reported rates have also decreased from 16% to 4%. 14%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next, let's also see how we're doing compared to teens in Connecticut and around the country. For comparison, we used the 2017 Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the largest public health surveillance system in the United States, monitoring a broad range of health risk behaviors among high school students. Stafford is the gray bar, Connecticut the orange bar, and National is the blue bar. You see that reported cigarette use rates among Stafford High school students are lower, marijuana use rates are the same, and alcohol use rates are slightly higher. 
In addition to, in addition to past 30-day use rates, the partnership pays close attention to reporting binge drinking rates, which is defined on the survey as having five or more drinks in a row. Binge drinking is dangerous in a high-risk behavior that impairs judgment and opens the door for serious consequences, such as sexual assault or alcohol poisoning. We are, we are encouraged that binge drinking rates are also decreasing. <coughs> the partnership also monitors use rates of other drugs, including use of prescription drugs without prescription and heroin, use of pain relievers, tranquilizers, and stimulants, all without a prescription were reported by less than 3% of all high school students. We also asked teens who reported abusing prescription drugs about why they did, and of the 174 students who reported ever abusing prescription medication, the most often reported reason why was to get high or to cope with anxiety slash stress, which was 16%, to cope with pain, which was 14%, or to enhance academic performance, which was 13%. Here's some more good news. Teens are asked to report on whether they were involved in several risky behaviors in the past year. 1998 is the orange bar, and 2018 is the blue bar. In 2018, reported rates around driving after drinking, riding with a driver who has been drinking, gambling, having sexual intercourse, skipping school, and hitting someone all decreased. The Stratford Partnership does more than work to simply reduce risk. We also work to build developmental assets. Search Institute has identified 40 positive supports and strength that young people need to succeed, known as developmental assets. In your packet, you will find the complete list of assets for your reference. Half of the assets focus on the supports, relationships and opportunities you need in your families, schools and communities, which are external assets. The remaining assets focus on the people, the social emotional strengths, values, and the commitments that are nurtured within young people, which are the internal assets. On one level, the 40 developmental assets represent common wisdom about the kinds of positive supports and strength young people need, but extensive research reveals that assets can have a powerful influence on youth behavior. <coughs> the Search Institute's research consistently shows that youth with higher levels of developmental assets are more likely to thrive now and in the future, less likely to engage in a wide range of risk-taking behaviors such as substance abuse, violence, and antisocial behavior, and are more likely to be resilient when faced with challenges. This graph illustrates the average number of risk-taking behaviors reported among Stratford teens in, in the 2018 versus oh in 2018 versus the reported number of assets. The bar on the left shows that students reporting the fewest assets, 0 to 10, <coughs> engage in an average of 7.6 risk-taking behaviors. The bar on the right shows that students with the most reported number of assets, 31 to 40, on average engage in less than one risky behavior. So there's definitely a big difference. <coughs> The chart shows that 48% of Stratford youth report having 11 to 20 assets, followed by 35% reporting 21 to 30 assets. It's important to note that assets matter for young people from all backgrounds, regardless of gender, ethnic or cultural heritage, economic situation, sexual orientation, or geographic location. These assets both promote positive behaviors and attitudes and help protect young people from many problem behaviors. Specifically, we want to draw your attention to these increases. There was, an, a, there was a 19% increase in the number of teens who report that their parents and other adults model positive, responsible behaviors. There was a 36% increase in the number of teens who report that their best friends model responsible behaviors. There was a 20% increase in the number of teens who report that their school provides clear rules and consequences. And lastly, there was a 28% increase in the number of teens who report that their families have clear rules and consequences and monitor their whereabouts. I can personally attest to this report because my mother definitely has a no-nonsense approach with my brother and I. 
she clearly sets the rules in place and warns us of the repercussions that may follow if we break these rules. So I definitely try my best to stay on the straight and narrow path to success. Consistently, Stratford teams report high levels of parent disapproval. Although parents may feel like they have little influence over their teens' decisions, they are in fact among the most influential factors in preventing their child from using substances. Surveys of teens repeatedly show that parents can make enormous difference. This slide compares a group of teens who reported that their parents disapprove of them drinking alcohol or using marijuana versus a group of teens that do not feel their parents disapprove of them using these substances. As you can see, the use rates of the teens on the left who believe their parents disapprove are significantly lower than those on the right who believe that their parents don't disapprove. And I can also personally attest to this in the fact that um, always growing up, my parents have always shown me right from wrong. So a lot of the time, I don't even think about like doing these risky behaviors that we discussed because I know right from wrong and my, follow my parents' example. So they do really have a big impact on my choices and decisions. Prevention never stops. Prevention science makes it clear that if we want to prevent a problem before it happens, we need to continually, keyword continually, address and reduce risk factors while increasing protective factors. This isn't a one-time thing. We can save lives and money only if we continue to invest in an evidence-based prevention. Remember, prevention is better than cure. In 2018, close to one in three high school students reported that they drank alcohol in the past month, 31%, and 17% of all high school students reported binge drinking in the past two weeks. The partnership is committed to reducing the number of underage teens drinking in Stratford by continuing to support alcohol compliance checks and park patrols conducted by the Stratford Police Department. Police officers recently distributed counter mats created and printed by CT distributors to look at merchants to remind adults at the point of sale not to provide alcohol to minors. The Stratford Partnership is addressing this fast-growing public health concern sweeping our country. In 2018, 23% of high school students reported using an e-cig to vape nicotine, and 12% rep reported vaping THC or marijuana. You have easy access to e-cigs, as well as believing that they are harmless. We are working with the schools to make students aware that the long-term effects are unknown, essentially making our generation the guinea pigs. A four-minute video, What You Should Know About Vaping, was sent by the superintendent to families of all middle and high school students. Also, the youth committee is currently in the middle of our vaping campaign. Um, we have we created a label that was placed on individual packs of microwave popcorn. <coughs> Um, and the reason why we did that was because we have an actual popcorn long as a picture on it. Um, so it says, vape, it says vape, crackle, pop. Which one do you prefer, popcorn or popcorn long? And on the back, we have vape facts. So we're going to just pass it around the room so you can see. Um, the label has a picture of popcorn long with facts on the back about vaping and how dangerous it is. We passed out over a thousand packets at the Thanksgiving game back in November. And we also plan to pass out the rest of the packets to the high schools and middle schools and talk to them about this growing issue in our society. Also, um, the Stratford High School's Hosa chapter had the opportunity to meet and speak with Senator Blumenthal um, last week. And we were talking about Going 21 with tobacco. I'm not sure if anyone has heard of that. Um, Hartford actually just I'm pretty sure they just passed the bill to make the age 21 in order to buy tobacco um, products. Um, I know other towns are also trying to make this happen, including us. So um, we actually asked Senator Blumenthal for a letter of support, and he said that he would more than be happy to give us one. So we'll be in touch with him, um, because we truly believe that this is um, a serious matter, and we should try to get the age to 21. Additionally, one in five high school students agreed that it is okay to drive if you smoke marijuana. The partnership keeps an eye on perception of harm reported by youth. The less, the less harmful a teen perceives the use of a substance to be, the more likely they are to use that substance. As more states legalize marijuana for adult social use, <coughs> use 
a youth increasingly believe that it must be safe for them as well. However, the introduction of a mind-altering substance, such as marijuana, to the developing adolescent brain is never safe. 90% of addictions start in the teen years. According to the Centers for Disease Control, more Americans now die every year from drug overdoses than they do in motor vehicle crashes. And the majority of these overdoses involve prescription medications. And sadly, we know this is painfully true. In 2017, 14 Stratford adults died from an overdose. The severe and lethal consequences of opioid abuse disorders compel us to action. Stratford residents are encouraged to properly dispose of medication at the medication drop box at the Stratford Police Department, which typically collects over a thousand pounds each year. In partnership with the Health and Fire Departments, free overdose prevention and Narcan administration workshops are offered, and CARES, Hope and Support Group for those with a loved one struggling with substance abuse disorder meets every Monday at the Stratford United Methodist Church. We are concerned about the increasing reports of depression, which is also a trend in Connecticut and in the U.S. Mental health issues are often intertwined with substance abuse disorders. Students who reported feeling sad or depressed have significantly higher substance use rates for alcohol, marijuana, cigarettes, and prescription drugs. Through mental health first aid courses, Stratford residents learn how to identify, understand, and respond to signs of mental illnesses and substance use disorders. Um, and some statistics on that are that 23% of all students reported feeling sad or depressed most or all the time in the past month. And also reported rates have increased 35% since 1998. So this is just some of the data, just a snapshot, a little bit of the data that we want to share with you all today. Um, this presentation along with the complete 2018 Search Institute student survey results are, um, they're posted in the Stratford Partnership website and the website address is on your info brief in your packet. So thank you. So we just have a couple of questions that we wanted to ask. So does anyone, anybody want to answer what surprised them about this data? How well you presented it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Is there anything? Oh. I have a question on the facts that you presented. What surprised me on a jewel for the data? And a pod is the same amount of data. What is the size of the pod? Is that just, what is a pod? It's really small. It's literally like this. It's like a little circle. Like half an inch. Half an inch, yeah. <coughs> and it contains a liquid. Like it's inserted into the device. Oh, and that's the pod. Yeah. 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 What's triggering their depression? Is there, is, that, is there anything specific in the survey? <coughs> um, we have a question on our survey. We do ask about sources of stress that the students identify themselves. Um, that data comes up in their perception around academics or about everything else that we have in the home life, social scene, um, planning for college. So their perception is that the academics stress. Um, I think to get to the bottom of that, we really need to have <coughs> more really from the personal focus group type of discussions with the students. But it is something that we talk about often with our coalition and um, wellness issues. So if I could just add, I think the other thing is that, um, to note about that is that's a trend. That it's not just unique to Stratford. We have Stephanie Moran from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I don't know if you have to say something from the Dr. Patel spot. Am I? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, again, you know, Stephanie brings that expertise. You know, I don't know if there's something you want to comment on. Sure. So, hi, everybody. My name is Stephanie Moran. I'm here um, representing the Office of the Commissioner from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. 
Um, and from the statewide perspective, we, we are seeing this as a trend. Um, it's not unique to Stratford. Um, we are seeing it, the, the same thing happen in other communities. Why? Um, it's very unique to the community. Um, so again, with what Nina said as the acting evaluator for your coalition for your community, definitely um, I would recommend, if that's something you're interested in, just you know, diving deeper, asking the students, talk to the students, and you know, see why they answered it that way. But um, from what I know is that we are seeing it across across the state and even nationally as well. So I guess it's back to local problems require local solutions, right? So we know we know our answers, so it's to dive deeper and understand better because what may be an answer in another community may not be possible. So thanks, Stephanie. I'd just like to add a plug for the school district has partnered with the partnership to really focus on assets. And for anybody who does isn't already familiar with this, doing for us as Rowan's in the room a deeper dive on this asset building because it shows up in the work that's getting done, whether it's over at the library, I mean, there's so many places. And as we face challenging budgets, I think that this is one of the things that if we're concerned about the depression rates and we know that asset building can be one of the strategies that really tackles that at a root cause and creates, you guys mentioned that it creates thriving in the future as well, then that's something to not let go of. It sounds soft from a budget standpoint, but it is at its core. So I just want to put that plug out there for everybody to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so is there anything that um, anyone was happy to see? Good things. Yes. Um, I was happy to see that the binge drinking rate has come down so much. Um, what do you feel like have been sort of the largest factors in reducing um, the number of students who are binge drinking? <coughs> You know, students might binge drink because they have nothing to do. Because when you have nothing to do, you do things sometimes that you're not supposed to do. So I feel like the students have a lot more to get involved with, whether it's sports or different clubs. Um, there's other outlets that they can get involved with. So I definitely think being more involved and having a structured life and a structured schedule definitely contributes to um, the lowering of the binge drinking rate, for sure. So I, I have to jump in. Former uh, police uh, chief Mike Ambrose is here. Oh my! I'm awake. Um, so Mike, um, Mike was with us in 1998 um, when we first started talking about reducing underage drinking. And I clearly remember people almost snickering when we would have this conversation about it's dangerous. We're concerned. And I can absolutely tell you when we did focus groups with young people about underage drinking, they were laughing out loud. And one of the things they said, because we asked this question, how, how hard is it to get alcohol? And it was a roaring laugh of, don't you mean how easy? And I would say absolutely for the support of the police department around compliance checks, parks patrols, and really working with our families to help them understand that how dangerous it is when you host a party, you are you are out of it is not a controlled situation. It's not safe. And for families understanding now the developing teenage brain, that you've done all this work to protect their brain. You put them in a helmet when they were on their bikes, you had them in car seats when they were babies. Why are you gonna let this precious brain be hurt with drugs and alcohol? So I think there's been a lot of shifts um, in the help of reducing access from both our, our retailers and our merchants, and, and that is why we're so proud to be a partner with uh, CDI, because they really take their responsibility um, very seriously in our community and are very supportive. You know, we see a shift. You know, one of the things that I, we pointed out was the parental disapproval, which is huge, and parents really under, understanding and monitoring whereabouts, right? That's all of those things that can get at that very dangerous behavior let me Anything else? Yes. So your your campaign, we're just so proud uh, of all the work that, that, that you do, and your ca campaigns are always so creative and eye-catching.
passion. Can you just give us a few, you know, um, words about how the creative process that goes into it? You could talk about that with the popcorn, the, the baking. I think that's like very catchy. Yeah. Um, so we started like by figuring out what were the um, biggest like substance uses that were being used. Um, and then we know that obviously vaping is a rising problem. So we really tried to figure out how we could focus on that and where it's not like too corny or whatever that people don't, or like that teens are gonna be like, oh, like that's just something like popcorn came because popcorn lung is a uh, very like well-known um, drooling issue. So we knew that and like obviously kids are gonna want popcorn so that would attract them. <laughs> And then they get it, and then they see the labeling on it, and um, it was really a lot of good work with Anna, too. She was a huge help in all that. Um, really great working with her. And yeah, just we're all very collaborative, so it comes together really well, and we all throw in our ideas, and look up our own um, information, and come back, and we have people who have certain strengths, and um, it really just comes together very well. just be like a little bit younger but so uh, <laughs> my uh, I used to have a roommate who was uh, very heavily involved in the baby scene the idea is that um, the more you do things towards it so like they there are people that mod their stuff there's people that um, that will buy something take it apart put it back apart so it, it, it can either range from something to thirty dollars to quite frankly like something like a hundred dollars to like 130 and it's something that you can continue spending money on and it's 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 it ranges yes most most definitely a status symbol yes work and all the other research is one significant adult in a child's life can make a big difference. And I know there are people in this room that volunteer as mentors and they stay with those children and they make a difference. So those of you that are here because you really care about our Stratford youth uh, and um, are not aware that we have a wonderful mentoring program, you can make a difference in a student's life. So I invite you to become a mentor. Thank you. partnership website and the website address is on the info brief that you got it should be in your, in your packet so and that has the presentation and um, the, all the information all the data you collected well, we would be happy to come to anybody who would like to 
would extend the invitation. Now, I can't guarantee that you get these two every time. But, but we, have, we have a whole group here that, could, that can rise to the occasion and make this presentation. So anybody have an interest, we'd love to, we'd love to take the presentation out into the community further. Yes? Hi. Um, this is a wonderful Okay, so when it comes to the youth, definitely one of the biggest things that entice them is food. You gotta have food. You gotta have food. It's the biggest thing. That's, 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 that's the biggest thing. So that's the first thing. The games, of course. Um, but it's just it's such an awesome environment. We have such great advisors and people who look after us. And, you know, it's, it's amazing because when you can get a group of students together that really want to make their community better, and see people, you know, get better. When they come together, it just makes it even stronger. And, you know, everyone who is in our youth committee, in the partnership, we all have the same vision, the same goals. We just want to get to them in different ways. So, you know, we definitely let everyone know, you know, you can make a difference in your community. And if they really have the yearning to do that, then they would like to be on the committee. Yes? Do you think the model of youth being equal to adults in your organization has an impact? Um, I definitely think it has an impact because, you know, it would be different if the advisors were telling us what to do and talking down to us, then we would have to follow what they're saying. But because they give us a little bit of that authority to make our own decisions and to actually, you know, head what we're doing, it makes us feel more responsible and like we can actually make a difference. So it, it just makes, it, makes us feel a lot better because we feel like we can come up with our own ideas, ask for approval, and then get it done. So, definitely. And to answer your second question, Tammy, I'm going to keep going on the first part. So we're really fortunate that we've had young people engaged, honestly now, for generations of youth. So, again, I guess I'm a little long in the tooth. So I go back, way back. And at one point, we had one student that would come to our board meetings. One student. And she was supposed to hold up, be the voice of all kids in Stratford. Not a very realistic explanation or, or, um, expectation. And she's the one who said to us, there really need to be more kids here if you want to have you involved. And so we listened to her and then engaged more kids. And now it's sustainable because they reach out to their friends. Because it's cool. We have two among many shining stars from our high schools who want to be a part of this. So they want to join and, and work with us. So we're really lucky. We're, we're building on a, a foundation of success. So we look at evidence-based program. We said briefly that we use something called the strategic prevention framework. So that's the model that you know everything that we do, we think of assessment and planning and interventions along the way. And when it comes time to pick the program interventions, we think about what do we know that has the evidence that works. So we're using things like Keep It Clear Mind, which is a sent home program for um, it goes home with kids that their parents do it do the uh, work on the materials together, and it opens the door to conversation. It's evidence-based to have young people in leadership roles. Um, reducing access is an evidence-based strategy. Compliance checks are known to work. So we really think about all the things that we're doing. There's so also something called the seven strategies for community change. And three of them are sort of individual strategies, and four of them impact the environment. So some of those individual strategies are things like provide information, have support. So we want to make sure that we have those things in place. But then we think about the environment that kids are in around access and consequences and what are the policies. So when we think about things, it's, it's not just let's pick this program, we know that works, we do that. But we also are thinking about these seven strategies because it's going to take to, to move the needle, right, to make a change. We have to be doing things in multiple places with multiple people. And as, the, as they said to us over time, we can't, it's like we can't let our foot up off the gas, right? Because we know it's going to be. So does that give you a sense? Anybody else? Um, 
just to encourage you guys, um, as, uh, uh, I just want to say I'm very happy to see the diversity that is in your group and the wide range of, you know, older, younger, you know, African-American, white, Spanish, all these different things that are going on. It paints a, a really beautiful picture of what it looks like when you actually come together. Um, you shouldn't have all the same people. You shouldn't have all the same um, kind of ideas. And it, it shows a, a, a very, very awesome picture. And you guys came in. I saw you guys. Uh, I met with him um, earlier today. And I, I saw, wow, I was like, there's a lot of things that are going on here. And very obviously, you guys are doing something that matters. And, um, not just on you know this level. I, I think on a whole other level as well. Um, so I wanted to thank you uh, for being something that is changing, it's actually doing something um, in more ways than I can do, you know. Um, so I you know, definitely want to do it. because we have different, obviously, female, male, African American, white, whatever, but it's also diverse in the schools. Even just this year, we just recruited people from Notre Dame, um, another school I forgot about, but it's definitely diverse, obviously, Shopper, but now. So we have um, kids, students from different schools, so they can give us our perspective in their school district and tell us what is going on. And it's just amazing because we all come together and we have different ideas and sometimes they're the same and sometimes we're like, I can't believe that's happening in your school. So it's just so many different things going on. So. <coughs> yes? I have a question. I'm sure there are other youth and family organizations throughout our state and other communities. And as a group, uh, I was curious, um, since our local government here in the state of Connecticut is considering legalizing marijuana to be used as recreational, wouldn't that be a detriment to your programs that you're trying to have children, younger youths not use it and it become more accessible when it's legalized, similar to what alcohol is? I uh, you know the comment was made about how easy it is to get alcohol by legalizing marijuana. Wouldn't that actually make it easier to access marijuana? And I'm not sure if the groups have brought that attention to our local government here at all. And is that something that you guys would approach in the future? I want to jump in. Uh, because we're federally funded, um, and as a federally funded organization, we do not lobby. So we will, we don't, we, so we, so because it is, as you said, it, it, there's probably going to be legislation to do so. We're, we're not going to take a stand on any particular legislation or advocate, but we are aware what our role is, is safety for the health of young people in our community. So we know without a shadow of a doubt that young people using marijuana is not a good thing for that developing brain. It, it just is not good for kids. So it is our role to make sure that as things change, and if indeed our state does legalize, that our young people and families know that that doesn't mean it's safe. So, because I think that's sort of what's happened is people are assuming it's safe. It happened when the, the laws were changed around medical marijuana for the conditions that have been approved to get a card to go to a dispensary. And so people are like, well, it must be safe. So again, we have to really be clear in helping people with information and understanding um, what is safe and what isn't safe. But I don't know if you two have a comment personally. I can comment personally. I, wanted, I just wanted to say, I know that it could be a detriment because legalizing it, that means that they'll have even more access to it. But I also believe that we're trying to instill those good values now, and that's why right now we're trying to let them know about the consequences and the health risk factors and all that, all of those things now, so that if they are tempted or if they, you know they have the opportunity that they'll have, you know that mindset and not want to get the marijuana or the alcohol. So that's why right now we're trying to push out these campaigns and. Um, in the past, we've mostly done it with the high school, but now we're even targeting middle school. And you never know, we might even target elementary. So now we're really trying to get into every single kid 
you know, whatever their grade level is, because I don't, I'm, I'm seeing it myself today, even younger kids starting to do, you know, these horrible things. So, you know, it's definitely a different generation, a different time. And that's why um, I believe that we're trying to instill that in them now before it's too late. Um, yeah, we did a campaign um, using social media, social media campaign, and we posted um, videos about um, <coughs> cigarettes, and we like it was like a reveal kind of thing, and prescription drugs, um, and that was just solely through social media, and it was like a raffle kind of thing, and if you commented and tagged three friends, then you were entered in the raffle just to get um, obviously a bigger following and just more awareness, and then other kids and their friends and then their friends and. Um, it, that was really good, too. Yeah. Yes. That gives me a segue to my comment. Uh, has the group, have, or does the questionnaire address the issue of um, addiction to social media and your phone and that sort of behavior? Mm -hmm. yeah. No. The survey is like 180 questions. Yeah. So we have to be very careful when we add um, because we just don't have the capacity to take that kind of survey, but we try to sort of update the survey as the issues come along, like the easy. Yeah. Yes? Uh, in regards to social media, uh, you know, what are some things that you guys have noticed that have worked, or some things that you guys have noticed that haven't worked um, when it comes to promoting uh, what you guys are trying to bring across? Because I feel like sometimes um, it can be difficult to relay a certain message that you're trying to bring. Um, so with social media, I think that things that have worked is when we do post certain pictures or, you know, certain facts, we definitely try to give a little caption to explain because there have been times where sometimes, you know, the followers are a little confused on different things, but that's why also we try to segue into things and give them a little bit at a time so they start to understand um, what we're doing. I think that overall the social media is effective though because a lot of the times kids don't go on our website, they, they see it on social media. So that's why we try to take whatever's on the website, reconfigure it, and put it in the social media. So overall, it has more ups than downs. Um, we're obviously still trying to figure out how to get it out there even more and get more followers, so we continue to do that, but overall, it's, it's mostly positive. But we can take one more question, if anyone has any. Yes. Um, before we get started on the closing remarks, I just wanted to quickly mention that we have another event coming up on January 22nd at Worcester Middle School. Um, we'll be showing the film Resilience, which explores the connection between stress and trauma and chronic disease and substance abuse. So everyone should have the flyer and hopefully you can join us for that event. Just wanted to mention that. Thank you. <laughs> Are they not amazing? Yeah. Um, I just, they don't know how to do this, but uh, today is um, a special day for Cherie. <laughs> <laughs> Cherie, would you like to tell us what today is? Today is my 18th birthday. <laughs> Share with you. Um, if you would be 
so kind as to tell us what college has accepted you? Harvard. <laughs> Thank you. 